Hi everyone, today I'm here with Dr. Chow, a uh, neurologist uh, who sub-specializes in sleep medicine, whose impacts in the field for uh, several years. So Dr. Chow, thank you for being part of this interview. Thank you. Great, great to be here. And so before we go into the details of neurology, could you briefly explain what neurology is? Neurology is a study of the, the brain and its uh, subsequent disorders. A neurologist can be expected to take care of patients with various uh, neurologic disorders, such as a stroke, epilepsy, um, neuromuscular diseases, uh, varying various uh, dementias and neurodegenerative conditions, etc. Those are things that maybe a general neurologist would probably see. Uh, what are the subspecialties of neurology and what are the, like, the couple most common cases of each of those subspecialties? As far as subspecialties go, uh, neurology is notorious for having uh, many. <laughs> so. Um, you know, there are uh, within that branch, uh, sort of name, similar to the different disorders, if you can name a disorder, there's probably a, a subspecialty for it. So there's people who are specialized in um, uh, movement disorders. There are people who are specialized in stroke. There are people who are subspecialized in neurocritical care, uh, epilepsy, I don't know if I mentioned that, as well as uh, sleep medicine, uh, which is uh, what I'm involved in. Uh, people who are involved with neuroinflammatory diseases, such as multiple sclerosis, varying types of peripheral nervous uh, uh, diseases. So there's there's a number of specialties which you can go to, and I, I'm sure I didn't list all of them, but that, that uh, uh, subsequently flow from the field of neurology. And about 70% of people who become neurologists go into subspecialty treatment. Why did you choose neurology and sleep medicine in particular? I liked sleep medicine mainly because of um, the experiences that I had in the uh, general neurology clinic. Um, a lot of patients would come in with complaints uh, that were unrelated uh, and largely about their sleep uh, to the uh, neurologic condition that I was taking care of the patient for. Um, and so I, I sort of saw a, a very important need as far as uh, addressing these uh, particular complaints and, and uh, studying more about it. What's a typical day in your life like from when you come in to when you leave? Yeah, so um, the life of a sleep medicine specialist is, is uh, uh, in many ways similar, but has some uh, per, uh, specifics about it that I think are, are different than the practice uh, that you see with say like a primary care physician. Certainly medically based, so there's not a whole heck of a lot of procedures that you're doing as a part of um, practice, but it's seeing patients in clinic um, and then taking, taking what you uh, sort of identified as far as the, the issues that may be um, bothering that particular person, um, look, uh, reading sleep studies and the performance of those sleep studies as well as uh, subsequently uh, starting them on different types of therapy, whether it be uh, if they have sleep apnea, CPAP device, or um, uh, other uh, sleep-related conditions, medication, um, as well as uh, behavioral techniques uh, with the patient, um, and then following them up uh, subsequently. And then there's sort of that element of things as far as the clinical practice, and then also uh, with that, you know, management of the, the sleep lab, uh, which many facilities will have, um, and the sort of protocols that we utilize to evaluate uh, these patients, etc. So you mentioned before that you do about 50-50, is it? Yeah, so, um, you know, depending on uh, what type of uh, practice you have, um, whether it be a large group versus small group basis, whether it be um, hospital-driven or clinic-driven, uh, the practice varies. Um, but uh, I spend about 50% of the time in the clinic seeing patients, and the other 50% of the time um, it's uh, administrative work as, as it relates to the sleep lab, um, as well as reading sleep studies uh, for the system. Okay, and then uh, what times would you come in and leave usually? The hours of a sleep medicine physician are fairly regular, so mm -hmm. you're talking about 8 to 5, 8 to 6 kind of schedule. Um, the sleep studies are obviously occurring at night, um, but uh, there's usually a uh, sleep technologist who is caring for that patient at night, and then you're reading a uh, reading the record in the in the room. And how is a sleep medicine uh, specialist a lifestyle different than that of a, or even their work uh, hours different than that of like a general neurologist? What I would say is is one of the main things from a lifestyle perspective that's different is is that we have the polysomnogram or the sleep study, and so um, while a, a, a neurologist who's simply a clinician um, uh, in which you are either 
prescribing medications or um, administering therapies uh, real time as, as far as procedures, uh, etc. That is all within the context of actually showing up at a certain place at a certain time and, and, and meeting with a patient and, and seeing people. Okay, uh, Whereas uh, the sleep study, it's a file. Uh, so um, I can read that any time, any place. Uh, it's, uh, it, it sort of frees you from the, the, clinical, ex the clinical experience um, to some degree, uh, which, which can be a bit of a grind um, you know, after you know, many years of practice. So um, I think that the fact that there's that sort of technical element uh, allows for um, a certain degree of independence and freedom with regards to your schedule uh, that you would otherwise uh, sort of be uh, slave to being in a clinic and seeing patients every day in and out. So maybe it's a little bit more like radiology in that sense where you can work from home a bit more? Yeah, but I don't know too many radiologists who are just working from home. <laughs> but yeah, in that way, it's... Uh, it, could be it could be something like that. You mentioned that uh, diff there are different practice settings for um, like sleep medicine physicians, and that kind of leads to varying levels of like uh, administrative and like clinical work. Uh, what employment types or practice settings are there available to um, sleep medicine uh, or neurologists in general? This kind of kind of broadly apply apply to the different styles of practice that you see um, out there as, as far as clinical practice. So, you know, you could be sort of like I am. A, a, an academic physician in a major medical center um, in which the responsibilities won't just be with regards to patient care. You know, you have certain a academic uh, responsibilities. We have trainees as far as both uh, neurology trainees as well as sleep fellows. Um, so there's, there's certainly that element of things. Also that it's more of an interdisciplinary practice, the practice of sleep medicine um, in, you know, encompassing both neurology, ENT, pulmonary, uh, to some degree, the cardiologists as well as uh, psychiatry, and so you're kind of working with with other people in, in in that regard. And depending on where you are, you may have a multidisciplinary clinic in which they're seeing multiple providers, um, and there's there's that kind of camaraderie and communication. But also, you know, you have these sort of academic responsibilities as far as administrative duties as it relates to um, not only the educational programs but um, metrics that you're looking at as far as the, the care you're delivering, as well as the, the, the quality that's coming out of your sleep lab, um, the education of the technologists that are there, etc. So, you know, it's a little bit, I think, uh, from an academic medicine perspective, it's a little bit broader than you would um, within the context of general sleep medicine in the community. Um, some sleep medicine specialists, they don't, they just practice clinical medicine, so they're just seeing patients and they refer out for the study to get the report back and they just take action based on that. Um, you know, there's also home studies versus in-lab studies, so um, some, some um, practices focus mostly on just the home sleep apnea testing, others focus more on the um, in-lab testing and some combination of, of both. So it sort of depends on your, your particular institution, um, also where you have responsibilities in the hospital, so you know, uh, how much of your practice is also spent you know, seeing patients in the hospital, taking care of other neurologic conditions. Mm -hmm. What's the most challenging aspect of being um, a neurologist and also a sleep medicine specialist? I think the most challenging aspect, again, is the th same thing that I think are the strengths are also the more uh, challenging aspects in that it is sort of uh, multidisciplinary. Mm -hmm. I'm not even talking about within the context of um, you know, different providers or, or the medical aspect, but certainly within the context of insurance um, as well as uh, medical equipment. Whenever you're prescribing medical equipment, there's a lot of different requirements and hoops that have to be uh, satisfied. Um, and so that it really takes a full team of, of support staff and people to answer phone calls to, to people to uh, put in the referrals for the for the equipment and to follow up with patients, make sure they're using the devices, etc. So it, it it has to definitely be sort of like a, a, a team approach, uh, and I think that's probably sort of the non medical aspects of the practice of sleep medicine um, are probably the most challenging. And would you say that's probably similar to general neurologists too? Or? To a lesser extent, because a general neurologist is less device driven. There's less of these mandates. Well, there are there are limitations in certain in terms of people's ability to get therapy at certain times and, and affordability and cost, etc. I think that it's probably the there's a little bit more of that burden 
um, in terms of sleep medicine than you would have in, in general neurology practice. So what's the most rewarding aspect of the specialty? Oh, of the subspecialty or of neurology uh, in general? Of both. Well, I think uh, neurology is uh, very rewarding in that we're learning things all the time about the uh, about the specialty. There's a lot we do know. There's a lot we don't know. The mind is still very mysterious to us. Um, and uh, while we do have therapies available and treatments, there's still a lot that we can that we feel that we can do to to improve things and to go further um, in terms of the care of neurologic patients. Um, most of what we do, honestly, is preventative uh, and symptomatic therapy. We're not really altering the course of these diseases. And so I think uh, sort of a lot of the excitement is, remains in the unknown and the, the mystery of it all and that we have, there's a lot of, that there's a lot more that we can do therapy-wise to kind of change the to overall disease progression. Uh, from the sleep medicine side, I think uh, it's, it's actually that, uh, in that what you're doing is is that you're a lot of the time you're taking care of people who are otherwise well, okay, but that you have a problem and you're addressing that problem. And I think it's very, as opposed to the neurology side where it feels like you're just trying to stave off disease, okay, uh, in the uh, and you know sort of mitigate damage that's already occurred. Whereas in sleep medicine, you're really being proactive about sort of a more wellness-based approach as opposed to just simply the absence of disease. So I think that's one of the things that's very rewarding about sleep medicine is that these are people who you're improving their quality of life uh, and impacting that element of things, which is, which is great. Are there any misconceptions about the specialty of general neurology or the specialty of sleep medicine? As far as neurology is concerned, I think a lot of people feel as if it's more of a, of a diagnose and then adios type of, of specialty. And I think that there are emerging therapeutics in neurology that, of which people are not necessarily aware. Um, and I think that that's something that um, is very encouraging. And it's not as um, kind of depressing as I think people, people kind of assume as far as just there to give people, you know, terrible diagnoses and then, and then, and then you know, say good luck. So I think there's a lot of a lot of ways in which you can impact people and improve their outcomes, and as well as to improve their quality of life within the field of neurology that's not recognized. Uh, I think when most people think about uh, the the neurologist in the grander scheme of things, as far as sleep medicine is concerned, I think the impression for most people is that it's all obstructive sleep apnea. Okay, it's like every 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 problem is obstructive sleep apnea, and that uh, there's. Uh, that's pretty much what you are. You're an obstructive sleep apnea doctor. And although that's a big portion of the, of the uh, practice, you know, we also have a number of other conditions which uh, we treat. Um, and there's an old adage that if you, know, if you haven't seen it, okay, you don't know it. Okay? You can't know what you haven't seen. So I think uh, a broader knowledge of sleep medicine as a whole um, and a greater recognition of its importance in terms of the quality of life of even non-neurologic um, and just humans in general, it needs to come to a greater degree of awareness. So for medical students interested in neurology, what tips would you give them to get into a good neurology residency and maybe a good subspecialty like sleep medicine? In terms of tips, is you know the same tips I'd give to anybody who wants to have freedom in, in, in terms of choice, okay, so you know, do uh, pay attention go to class, which a lot of uh, <laughs> students don't do. Um, but if you don't go to class, make sure you read the notes. Uh, uh, and then, um, you know, uh, while board scores are important, I would say that their uh, neurology is very similar to like internal medicine and general surgery as far as like scores and that kind of thing. So, you know, your emphasis should just be to like, to do well on your board exam. Your emphasis should be well to, to kind of find out what it is that you are passionate about and that you like to do and can see yourself doing in the future and uh, to, to pursue it aggressively. I think one of the issues with, with medical school and just all the things that lead up to it is that it's very competitive. But what I think students will realize is that degree of competition becomes less about, well, it's the competition becomes less because there's fewer people there to compete with, okay? Um, but at the same time, you shouldn't do something just because you can. You should do something because you like it. <laughs> and um, I think I think that sort of gets lost within that kind of um, that sort of pyramid. And and more options become available, and more choice becomes available as you get farther along when you're looking at 
you know, going from college to pre-med to med school to residency, residency to subspecialty training and then sub-subspecialty training. The pool of people that are even looking to do any of these things becomes smaller and smaller. And so it's you really have the your pick of the litter of where you want to go and what you want to do, but you should be genuinely passionate about whatever it is that you uh, are, are, are going for and not just kind of looking towards the next step. Do you think a medical student should do research in neurology if they want to get in, or is that not really necessary? I would think they should get involved with the clinical, well, it depends on what they want to do in their life. You know, if they're interested in neuroscience and they're interested in pursuing, um, you know, uh, MD, PhD, MD, MPH, or uh, even being an MD who is very much involved in research, then they should pursue. They should pursue that certainly. But I don't think that that is um, a requisite. You know, I think that it would be more valuable if you're if you're interested in pursuing the clinical aspects of, of neurology or sleep medicine to, to do exactly that. You know, and to shadow somebody who um, is is in the field um, and to decide whether or not you like their scope of practice. That would be the best best way to tell. How well are neurologists and sleep medicine physicians like generally compensated, and how well are they compensated relative to other fields? There's a number of factors, uh, but compensation has to do with geography. Okay, compensation has to do with the particulars of that specific practice uh, that you're applying to. I mean, as a physician in general, you're going to be well compensated regardless of what subspecialty or or general specialty or general practice you you go into so that shouldn't be I mean while it is an important factor as far as you know, loans and debt and all that kind of stuff you're gonna end up okay the sky is the limit as far as how much you want to work <laughs> um, how many sleep studies you want to read how many patients you want to see you know where you want to practice what what the place that you want to be how much you want to, the time you want to spend with your family I would say that as you go along in your career while I think the initial attraction to most people, or as you, when you're younger and, and sort of earlier in the process, um, the salary means a whole lot. Uh, I, I'd say that it, it, it definitely, you consider a lot of other factors, mostly your quality of life and whether or not what you're doing is sustainable for the long term. That, I think, plays a lot more into it than what the actual you know, salary is going to be. But I would say it's on par with you know what you would expect in you know if you were in, in internal medicine or, or, or something like that. Um, but it, it it's it, it's very variable and totally depends on a number of factors. So you recommend for people that are interested in trying to maybe like increase that finance compensation, that'd be more a function of working more hours. Yeah, I mean you can. So for example, if you want to live in California, where things cost you know, two to three times as much in real estate than they do in other parts of the country, then your your money's not going to go as far. Okay? Uh, you're also going to probably earn less because more people live there and want to live there and there's more doctors doing the same thing that you're doing. If you go to a underrepresented area where they're in dire need of, of your services um, and you're willing to see a lot of people, then you can earn significantly okay? and your cost of living will be low. So it, it's not something that I would say that is specific to neurology or sleep medicine or anything like that. It's just a function of what are your priorities in life. And I think that most, depend, the, one thing is true though, is the more subspecialized you get, the less options there are. Doctors in general are, are in great need in the United States and in everywhere else in the world. So you know, you're gonna find a job doing whatever your general specialty is or your general practice is and then how much you are going to be doing of that subspecialty depends on um, like I said those factors you know how much um, how much you're earning how, where you're located uh, what opportunities are available for that but the more subspecialized you get generally the fewer the opportunities uh, because it's just there's there's not as much need what tips would you give uh, new physicians to manage their finances better one of the things i would say is the money you save now is worth more than the money you save later okay so just being a physician in general everything's backloaded you're 10 years after your peers okay so people are graduating college they're starting their careers then that being said you're fairly well compensated okay so the smart thing to do is that when you've when you you know start your career is to 
you know, not going to have a lot of pent up desire to go and spend that money. Okay. You shouldn't. Okay. The, what you should do is you should put it away. Okay. Whether it be your 401k or whatever savings plan you got set up, but explore other avenues for investment, buy a house, do those kinds of things. You know, the things you should avoid, buying a flashy car, going a lot of expensive vacations, eating out every night. It's the same thing that you could say to, to everybody. But what I'd say is, is that the, the money you're earning, you're really behind, okay, for in terms of that compounding interest that usually occurs uh, when people start their careers. So you really have to be saving at a much higher rate than your peers because you're because you are about 10 years behind them as far as medical school, residency, fellowship training, you're actually paying for medical school. So you're, you're going into, a lot of people, they go into debt. And speaking of debt, pay the debt first. Okay, so pay off, pay off the high interest debt and then work on those other, other avenues. But pay, up, pay off all your debt first and then start and, and save as much as you can early because uh, then it will give you more flexibility as you go forward. Also, depending on what subspecialty you choose, different specialties have a different sort of expected professional lifespan. You know, uh, if, you're, if you're very procedural based using your hands, your surgeon or something like that, you're not going to be working until you're 70 years old. You know? um, if you're a pathologist, yeah, you could keep working until, until you pass out at your microscope. So, um, you know, those, those considerations have to be made uh, as well. Um, so I would just say really save a lot early on uh, mm -hmm. and then and then see what you can do after that. <laughs> mm -hmm. Since medicine is like changing so fast and you mentioned neurology too, there's like so much that they're trying to like discover. How do you stay on top of all the advances? You subscribe to the journals when you read the articles. And so um, a lot of what you do you know, in, in residency as well as what you do in medical school is you read textbooks and you get that foundation and then you read to your patients, you know, like whatever that person has and you explore it and then things lead to another, okay? And then you can kind of basically pick up the breadth of knowledge just by virtue of experience and then reading about it. I would say that as you go further in order to stay up to date that you should subscribe to like neurology, the journal, uh, or brain um, and, you know, pick out interesting articles that things that pique your interest or you think that'll be relevant to your practice and, you know, spend some time uh, to, to, to stay abreast of the literature. Going to the meetings uh, um, also will give you sort of a crash course in whatever's been going on that past year research-wise or just being involved in it yourself uh, as far as uh, moving things forward with regards to the field. How do you avoid burnout and what tips would you give us to avoid burnout? One is I became a neurologist and a sleep medicine specialist, okay? So I don't think that there's a high degree of burnout within this specialty. Things that come to mind as far as burnout are concerned are ER medicine, trauma surgeon, okay? OBGYN, mostly the abstract obstetrics elements of things. You know, making sure that you uh, prioritize uh, yourself and, and, and with a mind of the phenomenon of burnout in terms of uh, the opportunities that you take as far as career forward, etc. Uh, don't jump at the first opportunity. Um, don't think of a, a lot of most people. Okay, do not stay in their first job out of residency. That job is is not necessarily going to be permanent for you, and there's a lot of different reasons why. Um, but you should kind of uh, make sure that while you know a salary may be attractive, or a location may be attractive, or um, whatever part of that practice seems good to you, you want to make sure that you enjoy going to work every day, you enjoy the patients you see, you enjoy your colleagues that you're working with, you're happy with how your day-to-day -day practice is. And I think that's the thing to be looking for when you're looking at jobs and you're looking at um, uh, is actually what does what all these things look nice on paper and I'm glad we have this benefit package and you match and you do all these different things and you know we've got all these services available to you but what is my day-to-day -day gonna look like okay and in order to sort of meet those expectations that you know those partners or the um, or the practice has of you okay and so you want to you want to get a kind of a good idea of what your day is going to be like and do you, are you going to enjoy being there and I think that's a that's a really important component of it seems like your specialty and subspecialty are more conducive to having a work-life balance, but what tips would you give us to establish that work-life balance? Other than just choosing one that yeah. is good for you, 
um, taking time out to do the things that you enjoy. Uh, I would say that does start in medical school. Get some physical activity, get some sunshine. Uh, you're no good if you're not sleeping. You're no good if you're just strung out on coffee and whatever. Um, so, you know, uh, one thing that you, if you ask people that are successful, they always say is I sleep eight hours a night. Okay? I get a good night's sleep. Okay? And so coming from, from my specialty, I would say that you have to uh, prioritize your own health okay, first and foremost, and then only you can engage in these kinds of things. You know, get that awesome board score or, you know, uh, you know get a high pass or whatever honors in, in your uh, rotation. I would say that, you know, those are things that you can do to make sure that you have a good quality of life early on. And then in residency, I say I think the same thing, same things apply. Uh, try not to do too much, okay? Like, you know, it's it's great to do research if you can, and but if you don't have time for it, then you know, make sure that you're number one. Are you taking care of your patients well? Okay, are you taking care of yourself? And then yeah, after that, then you can sort of do the other things. But I would say that those those are the things. Those are the priorities. And then you know, once you're attending level, making those right career decisions. This is a big part of it. Um, and then also. Um, you know, carving out a niche for your, your family and, you know, um, you know, recreational things. It becomes progressively easier as you go up. Um, but some people don't see it that way, and some people just get engaged with more and more and more. So, you, again, you have to kind of make sure that you're uh, sort of set yourself up for, for success, for a long, happy career. Where do you see medicine going in the next few decades, either generally or, like, in your specialties? As far as neurology is concerned, I think there's a lot of work being done in terms of biologic therapeutics okay, and um, more individualized medicine as well. And so I think that's a, that's a pretty exciting area um, that's being explored. As far as uh, sleep medicine is concerned, I would say that a lot of it is happening with or without the presence of uh, people knowledgeable about the uh, the profession, okay, or about sleep medicine in general. So, um, if you go to the Consumer Electronics Show, if you look at the type of things that are being marketed by our big tech companies, a lot of them are about sleep, okay, and they're actually looking to very much involve themselves in people's sleep health because it's a problem and it's an issue uh, that affects literally everyone, okay. So, um, I think. A lot of people are very much interested and involved. I think the technology is kind of where things are going as far as uh, sleep medicine is concerned, ways of measuring physiologic processes that are happening all the time. And not only just in terms of the diagnostic and, and measuring components of things, but therapies as well. And so I think there's a lot of, a lot of interesting things happening in sleep. And uh, it's sort of happening on, from the perspective of industry, as well as the basic science, as well as you know, clinicians as well as um, even these kind of like Kickstarter kind of uh, things that people are, are trying out. And then there's a lot of also emerging markets in terms of sleep medicine because this is a very relatively new field. You know, the practice of sleep medicine in China and in India and um, in Europe looks a lot different than it does in the United States. And so there's a lot of this kind of like um, sort of collaboration and a lot of sort of moving parts and things that are emerging in yeah. Would you choose the same career path and so especially again or is there anything you change about it? No, not really. Uh, I'm sit, you know, sitting from where I am right now, I would say I wouldn't change a whole heck of a lot. No. Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of physicians, they regret like what? <laughs> like going to medical school and if they would have done something else. I, I don't at all. You know, I think there's a very good mix as far as like seeing patients and then being involved with people, with, with science, with uh, technology, uh, with, with all the varying aspects that you would encounter. For somebody who doesn't know what they want to do, I think that that you know, internal medicine, sleep, uh, neurology, sleep medicine, these, there's, there's, there's anything that you want to do is, is there. I don't think that I would want to get completely involved in kind of the industry side of things because I do think I do like seeing patients. I do like practicing medicine. I think you definitely lose something in going that route. But I think it's fun to get kind of involved with, you know, the different tech and the different sort of chemicals that are being uh, invented with regards to, uh, to neurology and sleep medicine. But I don't think I would want to do that exclusively. What tips do you us to become good doctors? Okay, you go to class, read the book. 
<laughs> um, also, um, you know, making sure that you like uh, interacting with people, okay? And if you if you do, then you you should choose appropriately. If you don't, and you know that about yourself, you should probably. Uh, choose one that doesn't involve a lot of patient care if you want to be successful doing what you're doing. The main thing is you don't want to get involved with something and feel like you've gone too far. It's never too late, okay? There's a lot of people who have other careers before they even come into medicine, and I think that's happening more and more, and so you're, they're, they're more self-assured about what they want to do. It shouldn't be about money. It shouldn't be about, like, you know, a lifestyle or anything like that. You should genuinely like doing this, so I think that should be the, the one thing you should ask yourself, namely. And then if you do, then, then clinical medicine is for you. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Chow, for being part of this interview. Thank you guys for watching. If you have any questions, leave it down in the, below in the comment section, and I'll um, ask Dr. Chow and get back to you. And let me know who you'd like me to interview next. Thank you, and have a good rest of your day. Thank you.